Hello everyone and welcome back to the land of slots, panels, and hoarding tons of great loot. In part 2 of building an inventory system in the Unreal Engine 4, we'll be constructing the data management framework for how we can track and manage our item data. Before we get started, if you want to connect with me and follow my daily coding rants, feel free to follow me on Twitter and subscribe to the channel for more randomly educational content. Alright, let's hop in. Whenever you're dealing with content such as item information, you absolutely want it tracked in the database. Thankfully, UE4 has a nifty system for this called Data Tables. If you aren't familiar with these or their companion component, Structures, I highly recommend watching my tutorial videos on both subjects. You can find links to both in the description of this video. Let's get started by creating some enumerators that will house some typical values that we'll be working with. If you aren't familiar with the concept of enumerators, they're effectively values with special name. Instead of allowing any value to be used, we can use enumerators to limit our choices to an explicit set of options. You'll be seeing this shortly. In the content browser, right-click, select New Folder. Name this enumerators. Open it up. Right click again, blueprints, and select enumeration. Call it en underscore item underscore types. Open it up. As the name suggests, this enumeration will list each of the possible item types in our project. To save a little time, instead of verbally listing each item here as we create them, please take a moment to add some entries matching the ones on the screen. For the sake of the series, I've chosen a small subset of types that I generally use. To illustrate what I actually use in my current projects, here's a side-by-side -side comparison with what my personal enumeration looks like. Once you are done, we can close this and move on. We have one more enumeration to make, and that's for our possible types of rarity. Nothing makes a person feel more empowered quite like finding some magical or rare goodies. Once again in the content browser, right click, blueprints, and select enumeration. Call this en underscore item underscore rarity underscore types. Open it up. Just like before, take some time to create some entries like I have on the screen. However, feel free to expand, tweak, or change these types at your leisure. Once you have some rarities listed, that is a wrap to our enumerations. Now it's time to create the backbone of the data a given item has. Go back up a folder to our root folder in the content browser. Right click and select new folder. Named as structures. Open it up. Inside, right click, blueprints, and select structure. Call this st underscore item. Open it up. Now, due to the amount of information here, I'll simply just go through each one with a brief explanation and I'll let you create them on your own. Feel free to pause the video to do this. Number one, name. This is simply the item name. We're using the name type as it has faster lookup potential over the string type. Number two, types. A value representing what this item is used for. It is using the en underscore item underscore types enumeration that we created earlier. In a world where we can use the items in the inventory through right clicking or through another input, this will determine what happens when the item is used. Number three, description. Every adventurer loves to read the flavor text and items. This is simply the text that describes what this item's about and whatever detail you desire. Number four, icon. This is the texture that is shown on the slot that an item is assigned to. Make sure that for the data type, you are specifically selecting an object reference when you choose the texture 2D type. Number five, model. This is the 3D model that is used when the item is placed in the world. Make sure that this type is static mesh object reference. Number six, rarity. This is the rarity that is displayed to the user in the tooltip. The data type is the rarity enumeration we created earlier. Number seven, quantity. This is the amount of this item that exists in a given slot. By default, this will always be zero, but fluctuates as items are added and removed from the inventory. And lastly, number eight, stackable. This controls whether an item can have a quantity higher than one in any given slot. It's generally disabled for things like weapons and armor, but enabled for things like consumables and resources. I have this enabled by default. Take a moment to fill each of these variables in. Once you are finished, let's move on. Next, let's get our database up and running. Going back to the root folder in the content browser, right click and hit new folder. Call this data tables. Open it up. Inside, right click under miscellaneous, select data table. When you do this, it'll prompt you for a row structure. In the dropdown, choose the item structure that we created earlier and hit okay. Call this dt underscore items. Open it up. Here is where we'll manage each of the possible items that our inventory may have inside of it. I've gone ahead and added some entries, but feel free to take some time and add as many entries as you like. You might notice that some of the entries have some nice looking icons and models assigned to them. While I would love to say I made those, I can't. For this tutorial, I've added two free marketplace packs to the project to assist with the visuals. Links to both are in the description of this video. The only rule for adding content here is making sure that the row name value is set to whatever the name value is, but without spaces. This is required as data tables don't accept rows with spaces in the name. Once you have some entries added, let's move on. An important question we should be asking ourselves now is, where will we store our inventory data? While there are many potential places ranging from an inventory manager object all the way to the player controller, I've decided on using a game instance object for this series. For those unfamiliar with the game instance objects, they exist perpetually regardless of a change in level. Typically when we load a new level, change maps, etc., the world is entirely destroyed and the player's Thanos snapped away. 
This is detrimental when we want to have data persist between worlds such as inventory information. By keeping this information on a game instance object, we can prevent that data from getting dusted. To create a game instance object, right click in the content browser, blueprints, and select blueprint class. Under the all classes dropdown, search for game instance, select it and click select. Name this GI underscore inventory. Feel free to name this after your project instead. I just named mine inventory for ease of use. Open it up. All we'll be using this object for is storing our inventory data array. I'll also be referring to it as our inventory data cache. Let's add a new variable to this object called inventory data. Change its data type to st underscore item and make it into an array. Also make sure that this is set to an instance editable object. With that created, that is a wrap to our game instance object. Now, game instance objects aren't created like normal objects are. We actually have to specify them manually in the project settings. Back in the main editor window, under settings, select project settings. Select the maps and modes tab. And under game instance class, select our GI underscore inventory game instance object. Doing this will force the project to spawn our game instance object upon play and keep it existing until we close the game. With that done, let's move on. Let's start getting our widgets ready with some variables. We'll start with the inventory slot widget. In the content browser, open up our WG underscore inventory underscore slot widget. Open the graph view. Inside, add a new variable called inventory index of the type integer. Because of the way we'll be building our inventory system, we want the inventory slots to recognize their position in our inventory array. When they're created, they'll be provided their indices, which are stored here. Next, create a variable called information of the type st underscore item. A lot of our functions for manipulating inventory information will be handled by UI events. Instead of having them constantly make calls to our game instance object, each slot will have their own private cache of the item they're holding. That information is stored here. With both those variables made, let's move over to our inventory panel. Back in the content browser, open up our wg underscore inventory widget. Switch to the graph view. Let's add a new variable called inventory slots. Change its data type to an object reference for wg underscore inventory underscore slot and change it to an array type. This variable will house the list of slot widgets that are added to the inventory panel. Now with this done, let's move on. Something I omitted from the last video is something we'll need right now, and that is a main HUD widget. While this isn't fundamentally a part of the inventory system, it'll be used to house our inventory panel. If you already have a HUD widget set up, perfect. Feel free to jump past this part. Otherwise, let's quickly make one. Right click in the content browser, user interface, and select widget blueprint. Call this wg underscore main underscore HUD. Open it up. Inside, select our canvas panel element. Hit F2 for rename and call it main panel. In the details panel, make sure is variable is checked. With that, our HUD is ready to go. Let's quickly get it spawning and added to the screen. Back in the content browser, find your character blueprint. Since I'm using a first person character template, I'll be opening up my first person character blueprint found in the blueprints folder. Inside, find the begin play event node. If you are using a fresh character blueprint, move the event node a little to the left to make some space. Then add a create widget node. Set the class to our WG main HUD widget. Then connect this node to an add to viewport node. This will actually render the HUD to the screen. Connect the return value and target pins and connect the execution pin to the rest of the code that was already here. With this, our HUD is officially set up. The last part of this video will be getting our inventory interface created and on the screen. I know, took us long enough, eh? Something we need to consider before we hop in though is how we manage the functions for interacting with our inventory system. In the future, we'll be adding functions like add item, move item, etc. We need a way of organizing these so they're accessible in an easy manner. To achieve this goal, we'll be using our dear old friend, Function Library. In the content browser, right click and select new folder. Call this libraries. Open it up. Inside, right click, blueprints, and select blueprint function library. Call this bpfl underscore inventory. Open it up. The first functions we'll be needing are some reference collection functions that will simplify our code down the line. Call this first function get inventory game instance. As you can probably guess from the name, feel free to name this after your project. Inside, you might be a little confused that there is already a get game instance node here. The problem with this node is that it returns a generic game instance type variable. Now, while our GI inventory object is technically a game instance object, because this value is of the generic type, we only have access to the generic information that it provides, meaning no inventory data for us. In order to convert this reference so that we see it as a GI underscore inventory object, we'll be using casting. As a side note, if you're a little hazy on what casting is, I also have a tutorial video for that subject. Link is in the description of the video. Once you've successfully casted the value, we can add a return value to this function. Select the get inventory game instance node and add a new output variable. Call this game instance of the type GI underscore inventory. Then, connect the cast node to our new return node. Lastly, because this function only exists to return information, 
let's make sure that it is a peer function. In the details panel, make sure to check the peer checkbox. With that, we're done. Next, we need a function for getting a reference to our HUD. Add a new function called get HUD. Inside, let's add a return variable called HUD ref of the type wg underscore main underscore HUD. For this function, we'll simply just be grabbing all instances of the main HUD widget, which there should only be one, and returning a reference to it. Because this is also a data collection function, let's make it a peer function as well. Now, with that done, it's time to create our inventory. Let's create a new function called initialize inventory. This function will have two inputs. The first is called number of slots of the type integer. This will control how many inventory slots are generated in the inventory panel when the initialize function is called. The second input is called screen anchors of the type anchors. This controls where on the screen the inventory window is generated at. Once those are created, we'll also need to add some local variables that will be used by the impending block of code. Let's add them. The first is called inventory panel of the type wg underscore inventory. This is where we're going to cache a reference to the inventory panel so we can populate it with slots. The second is called hud ref of the type wg underscore main underscore hud. Like the above, it just simply is a cache reference. The third is called new slot of the type wg underscore inventory underscore slot. This is used to cache a reference to the newest slot during our slot creation loop, so we can set some variables inside of it. The last one is called game instance ref of the type gi underscore inventory. I'll save the explanation on this one for now as I'm very excited to show how it's going to be used. Now let's review this behemoth chunk of code. We start by capturing a reference to our HUD blueprint. Then we create a create widget node to spawn our inventory panel. Then we add our panel widget as a child to our main panel element inside of our HUD widget. Doing this will add our panel with anchors set to the top left of the HUD widget, which wouldn't really look that great. With that in mind, we then configure the position of the screen. We enable auto sizing on our panel so our HUD widget doesn't attempt to enforce its own scaling rules. We then set the anchors of our panel to those determined by our function input. Since changing anchors won't reset the offset values, we make sure to force these offset values back to zero using a make margin node. The last step for this section is grabbing a reference to our game instance object using our peer reference function. Next, we have a section of code where we generate the slots. We start by using a for loop, with the last index being the amount of slots we're attempting to create. You'll notice that we're subtracting that value by 1. Since we're starting at index 0, if we were to go to index 12, we technically iterate 13 times. To avoid this, we offset the maximum value by 1. Next, we use the create widget node to spawn our inventory widget and store it in a variable. Then, we take the current loop iterator value and store it in the inventory index variable inside the slot. This way, the slot knows its place in the inventory order. After this, we add the slot to our inventory slots array that is held by the inventory panel. After that, we add our slot widget as a child to the slot panel element inside our panel widget. Then, lastly, we simply add a comment to inform us that we've created a slot widget. So that's the code for creating our slot widgets. However, there is one big thing we'll be covering now, and I'll preface it with a question. How do we avoid losing our inventory data when the world is Thanos? What we'll be doing is using our game instance inventory data cache to keep a record of what's inside our inventory. When the world is inevitably annihilated, that data will still be around. Now, when we go to initialize the inventory again, the system will check whether our cache has any contents. If it doesn't, meaning that this is the first time we've initialized the inventory, it'll create an empty data cache of entries equal to the amount of inventory slots we've created. If it finds data in the cache, it'll loop through each of the slots we created and assign them the data found in their corresponding entry in the cache. Now, when I first found out I could do this, I lost my mind. I hope you're equally as excited as I am. Let's jump in. From the completed pin of our for loop, we need to check the size of our inventory data cache. It'll be zero if this is the first time we're running this code. Otherwise, it'll have some value. If it has a value, we'll loop through the inventory slots again, assigning each slot the value from the corresponding entry in the data cache. Then we simply print a message letting us know that the cache was used. Going back to the branch, if the cache is empty, we also loop through the slots once more, but this time simply create an empty entry for each slot. Now with that code in place, our initialize function is done. Let's hook it up. Jumping back to our player character blueprint, we need to add a little more to our begin play event. Just after our HUD spawn code from earlier, make a call to our initialize function. For slots, I'll give it 12, but feel free to play around with different values. For anchors, plug in a make anchors node. I'm using these values for mine, but feel free to experiment. After you're done, connect it to the original code that was here, and we're good. Let's test this out. Back in the main editor window, hit play. You should see our nifty looking inventory window appear, configured to how we designed it. Right now, we can't really interact with it or see it populated with any content, but we'll be covering that next time. In the next video, we'll start getting the key functions ready for making our inventory functional. And that's it. Thank you once again for joining me. If you liked this video or found it useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you'd like to see more. If you'd like to get in touch or hear my daily coding rants, follow me on Twitter. 
Most importantly though, leave your thoughts and ideas in the comment section below as I'd love to hear them. As always, I'll see y'all in the next one.